So, my name is James, and I get to be one of the teaching pastors here at Embrace. And um, I'm excited to dive into today's message. But before we, we do that, um, I, I feel like it's really necessary to kind of mention something. Uh, it's been weighing on my heart. And uh, if you've been watching the news at all this past week, you've seen some things. If you're on social media, uh, you've seen some things and maybe said some things. And uh, we as the church just kind of want to be able to speak into culture and, and kind of navigate, well, what does Jesus really think about all this stuff? Um, you know, I think it's tempting to try to kind of fit our uh, philosophy, our, our belief system, uh, and wedge it and, 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 and squish it into the teachings of Christ. But I, I, what I would love to do is for us to adopt uh, a vision of Jesus and, and figure out how our worldviews might fit into that. Uh, instead, you know, there's talk about abortion, there's talk about refugees, and, and just we got to be honest about what it says in the scriptures. It's not a left and it's not a right issue. We got to be honest with ourselves on that. It's not a left or a right issue. It's an up or a down issue. It's either God or it's us. And, and what I hope is that we're able to just really look at the scriptures and be honest with ourselves about it, what it says. You know, Jesus said, uh, you know, as far as abortion goes, uh, he came so that we would have life. Okay, I've got a lot of questions too, but I know that that's what this says. And, 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 I, and in regards to refugees, uh, you know, I've got a lot of questions, but I know what this says. And it says that if we reject the refugee, we reject Jesus. And so uh, I hope you hear me on this. This is not a James Barnett's opinion type thing. This is not an embrace thing. My opinions will be buried with me six feet under one day. But the word of God, it stands forever and it does not return void. And so my encouragement to us as the church, as we're navigating these issues that have been so divisive to our world and, and probably to a lot of us here today, I, I get that, is that we would just submit Jesus, 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 that it's all about him. So I digress. Uh, today's message is called Only God Could Do This. Only God Could Do This. And my hope from this morning is that that will walk away knowing that God works most powerfully in our weakness. That God works most powerfully in our weakness. Seven years ago, or roughly then, I was at a, a Christian event put on by some friends of mine uh, that I love dearly. Uh, there, there were thousands upon thousands of people in attendance at this event. L people literally from all over the world showed up to sing praise to God. It was so cool because it was like an actual picture of what heaven could be like. I mean, it's surreal to be in, in a stadium like that, singing praises, heaping praises onto God. I mean, it was nuts. It was so cool. And I remember after this really moving song, the pastor, he got up and he said, he just kind of looked around, he acknowledged all the energy in the room, and he said, yeah, only God could do this something we Christians like to say when we're getting the feels, you know? Yeah, only God could do this. And the place erupted with amens, one of which was mine. And, 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 and then I started to think, though, really? Only God could do this? I mean, I've seen quite a few inexplicable things in my time that literally only God could get the glory for. There was no other explanation. It had to be God. But this event, it seemed to have man's fingerprints all over it. And, and you know, I kept thinking to myself, I don't know, you know, with, a, with an adequate budget, solid marketing strategy, the, good production, good technology, compelling musicians, well-written songs, and the who's who of Christian celebrities as a speaker lineup, not only is it untrue that only God could do it, and hold on to your pitchforks because this is going to sound sacrilegious, I think we could do this without God. I was waiting for the lightning bolt. I think we're in the clear. <laughs> I've been to other events, not necessarily Christian events, that were equally compelling. The truth is, is, is we could not only have church without Jesus, but we could run church 
without Jesus. And maybe that seems weird to say, but in my 15 plus years of just doing church work, I'm often surprised at how long I go without mentioning the name of Jesus or relying on God's strength to accomplish my work. And it's the same outside of church work. That's, 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 that's the same outside of work, right? Sometimes instead of just being vulnerable and doing the things that God says he blesses, I just kind of do what I want and I ask God to bless it. You know, uh, God, I know in the scriptures it's the lowly that you say you bless, but I'd rather not look lowly. Can you just bless me with high position? Lord, I, I know in the scriptures that you say that you bless those who are persecuted, but I would rather be liked. Can you just bless me with popularity, lots of Instagram followers, so that I can make you famous, Jesus? You know, and I, and I know it's the empty that you say are going to be filled, but I'd rather not be empty. I'd rather not risk that. Could you just bless me with security? Thanks, God. That's how I do it. And actually, I've got a confession for you this past summer. This past summer, I've been, I've been wanting to make this confession to you as a church for a while. Um, like, when I was here preaching over the summer, I didn't take one full Sabbath day of rest. And maybe that doesn't seem like such a big deal. And maybe you think, well, that's just good work ethic. But, but you know, Sabbath, it's more than just about resting. It's about intentionally shortchanging ourselves So that the outcome of our life and the brilliance of our work cannot be credited to us, but actually only to him. But I was afraid. You know, I didn't rest last summer because I was afraid. For the sake of my reputation, I played it safe. They may have been biblical sermons, but they were overworked and well manicured. And where I just prayed for God to move in them instead of just coming to the stage empty, trusting that God does move. You know, in biblical history is riddled with people who have credited to God the overworked and well-manicured things of man. There's a story I want to share with you from the book of Exodus uh, that kind of highlights what happens when we ascribe to God the work of our hands. When we call our handiwork, albeit in good intention, our handiwork an act of God. When we, when we toss around language like only God could do this or God told me, um, when we slap his name onto, onto our stuff, pretentiously assuming his endorsement, which when we're wrong can serve as an indictment against the validity of Christianity entirely. So in Exodus, Moses, he's up on Mount Sinai, okay? So he's getting the Ten Commandments, and uh, the people down below, the Israelites, are starting to get scared because they, ha- they don't have a leader, and they're, they're freaking out, right? And so they're, they're, they, they go to Aaron, who is Moses' right-hand man, his little sidekick, and they say, hey, Aaron, uh, Moses, I don't, he's been gone for like over a month. What, we, need, we need a leader. We need something to look to for strength. Can you just make for us like an idol of God or something? And so Aaron's like, okay, yeah, sure. So bring me your jewelry. So bring, they brought him the jewelry, and scriptures tell us that he took some tools, and he started to chisel into uh, the whatever, however they formed that back in those days, and they made a golden calf. And so Moses comes back down the mountain, and he sees what's going on. These people are now worshiping this golden calf. Didn't take long at all. They start worshiping the golden calf. And Moses calls Aaron to account. He says, what the heck is going on, man? What are you doing? And, and Aaron, in an attempt to justify himself, essentially says, hey, man, listen. So I just told the people to, like, bring me their jewelry. And then we, like, kind of, like, threw it in the fire. And out came this calf. It's a miracle. In my opinion, that's a pretty sly way of saying, hey man, only God could do this, right? It's totally a God thing. Here's what happens when we do this. When we toss around such heavy language like that, we attribute things to God that God would have nothing to do with. We use him to carry out our agenda, an agenda that is usually pretty short-sighted or myopic compared to what he actually could do or would do if we let him. And I'm not saying this is always the case, but we do run the risk of creating God in our image instead of submissively letting him make us into his. We cast him in stone. We adorn him in gold, trying to spruce him up. Either way, making him unable to move, tethering him to our imagination. 
we reduce him to a finite being who is only able to accomplish his otherwise boundless work to the degree by which we can dream. But Ephesians 3 tells us that, that, that God wants to do more than all we could ever ask or, or more than all we could ever imagine. Or Isaiah 55, it says that he says to us, he says, so far as the heavens are above the earth, my thoughts are above your thoughts. And, and my ways are above your ways. Now, I want to guard against what could otherwise be a great misunderstanding. I'm not saying to avoid giving glory to God, but rather to just be very careful about what work we claim is his. You know, I'll, I'll, sometimes I'll hear people say, you know, God told me, and, and, I, and I get it, it's in good intention, but but. Sometimes what follows is like so antithetical to like what I'm reading in here that I'm like, what? It's so different from scripture that I'm like, God told you that? Really? Like, really? I can't reconcile what you're saying with what I'm reading. So like either this is really wrong and we got to start from scratch or you're really wrong and you're not, you're not in here and you're not reading about this. And we're having maybe a hard time hearing his voice. We don't know the voice of the shepherd because we're not spending any time in the sheep pen. Like I'm, I'm a little confused, you know? And we got to be careful about that because what we say next after a statement like, hey, I'm really feeling like God told me, really ought to make our, our knees buckle in reverent fear. In the Old Testament, if you got that wrong, you would be stoned to death. We cannot afford, the world cannot afford for us to get this wrong. The world is watching us and waiting to see what the God we follow is like. So, what does it look like, right? When we come to the table empty, when we come to the table vulnerable, expecting God to show up, when we let God loose to do his thing. There comes to mind one person in scripture who really embodies this. His name is Elijah. And there's a little backdrop for, we're going to read 1 Kings chapter 18, but a little backdrop first. There's a severe famine in the land, okay? And King Ahab, uh, this, this king, has forsaken the Lord to go follow other pagan gods because he's getting desperate, right? And uh, Elijah is the last prophet of the Lord because the other ones were all killed off. And so God goes to Elijah and tells him to go to King Ahab with a challenge. That's significant, by the way. God told him, right? He tells him to go to King Ahab with a challenge. So Elijah told Ahab to gather 450 prophets of Baal, which was the other pagan god, and to meet him on the mountain. Don't you get flashbacks to like the playground after school with that a little bit? Meet me by the monkey bars. That's what he's saying. And so when the 450 prophets of, of Baal showed up, there stood outnumbered, obviously, weak, vulnerable, and lone Elijah. So let's read from 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 21 through 39. Elijah went out before the people, right? And he said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, we'll follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bowls for us. Let them choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bowl and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. And then you will call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. Deal, right? Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Oh, Baal, answer us, they shouted, and there was no response. No one answered. And then they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said, surely he is a god. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. If you're reading from the English Standard Version, it says maybe your god is relieving himself. Elijah is a jerk. 
So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here. And he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it, large enough to hold two sayas of seed, which is about 15, what, liters here. He, he arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars of water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. So they did. Then he said, do it again. And they did it again. Then he said, do it again. So they did it again. The water, it ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O oh Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O oh Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. How great is that? It's not me, Lord. It's nothing that I am manicuring, right? It's not my overworked or, or well-manicured work, right? It's, it's you that's going to turn their hearts back again because I've done this. I came weak, and here we are. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Cool, huh? Cool story. The thing that stands out for me about this story is those jars of water. He didn't just pour one jar on there, not just one tiny jar, not one large jar, not four large jars, but four times three, 12 large jars. Is my math right? Yep. 12 large jars of water on the sacrifice, marinating, saturating this thing in water, spilling over into the trenches, making it impossible for anything to happen if God were not to show up. What's he doing? He's, he's stripping himself of responsibility. He's wiping away his fingerprints so that if this was going to catch fire. God would have to do it. So how many situations have you put yourself in like that lately, right? And I'm not talking about like slaughtering a bull and going head to head with 450 pagan prophets. I'm talking about putting ourselves in a situation where God has to show up. Not, not, to, not to test him, but rather just to bank on his promises. Do we know his promises? That's another that's another sermon for another day, but like, do we know his promises? Do we know what he promises to those who love him, who he calls children? You know, most of us, we want an extraordinary life. We want a God who will show up uh, with miracles. We want a God who comes through, but we're unwilling to put ourselves in a situation where only he really can, right? But when we're only willing to do ordinary things, we get ordinary results, but when we risk faith in an extraordinary father, we get extraordinary results. You know, we don't, we don't often live by faith. We live by sight. <laughs> I say we because I'm included in that, right? If the numbers don't add up or it's a bad financial decision, I'm out. We've structured our lives so that faith isn't even required. You know, we, despite what our dollar says, we don't trust God. I mean, we might have a checking account, but if that empties out, well, we've got a savings account. If that empties out, well, we've got a credit card. Someone's going to give us a credit card, probably against better judgment, but they will. Right? We don't really have to trust God. When that's depleted, uh, or I'm sorry, when, when, when we, replace, we replace our reliance on God with a retirement plan. Right? We don't have any wiggle room for the disruptive voice of the Holy Spirit because we've hinged ourselves to a five-year plan. We could go on and on, but, you know, I think the sobering truth for many of us is, is that if we stopped believing in the existence of God tomorrow, our lives wouldn't change much because we didn't believe in the promises of God today. You know, it was seven years ago. I was in Texas speaking at a, at a youth event when a girl named Becca, came up to me afterwards, asked me to pray for her grandpa, George. 
Uh, the doctors couldn't fa- figure out what was wrong with him. He was in the hospital longer than anyone should be, and he was in his final days. And I don't know what it was, but something in me told me it's, it wasn't really enough to just shoot up a quick prayer for George. I was compelled. I was compelled to go to him. I, I couldn't explain it. So I asked her where he was, and she said that uh, he was living in Dallas and that uh, their family was going to go road trip uh, to see him uh, the following day, as many of their other family members had flown in from around their con- the country to say goodbye. So, of course, I awkwardly asked, uh, can I have a ride? <laughs> they said yes. And when we got there, I-, I felt completely out of place. I mean, right here I am, this quiet dude in the corner, just, uh, just praying uh, while everybody is gathered around his bed in tears. It was the silence was sacred. So I'm sitting there praying, and I kid you not, I literally just blurted out, God is going to heal George. Whew. I couldn't believe it fell out of my mouth. I was so embarrassed. Um, but everyone just kind of turned and looked. I cleared my throat, <clears throat> and I said, uh, maybe we should just gather around his bed or something and pray. You know, I know Mark chapter 16 says that it, the that a sign that the Holy Spirit is present and at work is that people are putting their hands on each other, actually, and people are being healed. That's really cool. And I knew that James chapter 5 says that the prayer of a faithful person, a prayer of faith, will heal many. And I'm like, what if God meant that? I knew I didn't have much faith, but I just kind of prayed someone there did. So I was like, let's start to pray. So we're gathering around his bed. We first off pray for more faith because we know we're cowards and we know we don't trust God. And so we're like, Lord, just give us enough to move a mountain or heal a body. We'll take that, right? And then we prayed for healing over him and we said, amen. You want to know what happened? Nothing. Nothing. It was so embarrassing. I wasn't just embarrassed for myself. I was embarrassed for God. I was ashamed of God. I I remember thinking, just being so tempted to just start making excuses for him. So we we quietly got back into the van. They drove me to the airport probably pretty quickly, intentionally to get me out of there. But I got on a plane and I headed back to Florida. Now, the next day, I was sitting at a coffee shop working on my laptop and I got a phone call from a number I didn't recognize. And I answered. And on the other end of the phone was a bunch of screaming. It was a bunch of cheering and a bunch of laughter. And I knew the person on the line was like trying to tell me something, but it was so loud I couldn't really figure out what they were saying. Eventually she slowed down and she said, James, James, it's Becca from, you know, Texas. And, and I'm like, oh, hey, Becca. Hey, how, how are you? And she cut me off. She said, James, no time. Listen. George is completely healed, and he's up walking around the hospital. (laughs) I'm like, what? No. She said, yeah. And I was like, what is amazing? And she said, the doctors, they have no idea what happened. They couldn't even figure out what was wrong with him in the first place, right? He's been in and out of the hospital for years. And, And they couldn't, they had no idea how anything like this could ever happen. And I was like, well, but you told them, right? Like, you know how this happened. Like, we know. Did you tell them? She said, oh, well, yeah. Yeah. I told them only God could do this. You know, I've got about a hundred stories that didn't turn out this way for everyone that did. Sometimes we'll get God wrong. We'll think we're hearing him, and maybe it's not really him. We'll we'll think we're carrying out his agenda and maybe it's ours. And and when we get him wrong, we just need to humble ourselves, y'all, and just apologize and ask for forgiveness when we do. But sometimes we'll get him right. And when we do, it's enchanting. Some questions for you this morning. Uh, What could you, like Elijah, intentionally get yourself into? So that God had to show up. Where is God? In what area of your life is he calling you to be more courageous? 
Are you willing to look like a fool for him, knowing that he came and made himself a fool for us? Or, or do we want that kind of faith where we're willing to say, you know, like, God said it, so I'm just going to trust it. You know, yes, where we can say, yes, things look really, really, really dim. But I'm just going to believe that God is in the business of miracles. And not only that, but he is in the business of using us to carry out his miraculous work. And the question, church, the question is not what will happen if he doesn't, but what could happen if he does? Let's pray. Lord, I'm sorry, Lord, I just didn't even, I, I said your name and it was too casual. I just, I don't know, Lord, like I'm talking to you, God, like actually talking to you. Like I know that you see this and I know that you hear this and sometimes I don't really pay attention to that. I think I'm just talking out loud. And um, Lord, just forgive me. Like, Lord, you are so good and so high above us. You are so perfect and so worthy. Lord, help us to catch a glimpse of what you're doing in the world and trust that you're inviting us to be a part. Lord, give us the courage and the faith required to put ourselves in positions where you show up. Because whatever we're bringing to the table is really just not all that great, if we're honest. But what you bring to the table is everlasting. We want that. And we believe that. In your name we pray. Amen.